Hello and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk ETC. Once again, I will be running the show as Carlo is still on travel. Today I have uh, two guests with me, Maxwell Sanchez and Justin Lestate. Is, did I pronounce that correctly? Oh, uh, you were close, Justin Fisher. Oh, Justin Fisher, I'm sorry. And they are from Vera Block, right? Did I say that correct? Yes, Vera Block. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so they're gonna talk about their uh, technology that they've been working on. And uh, I've chatted with Max before, at, well, Justin as well, and they are very bright guys. I'm sure you will benefit from this discussion. So um, let's, let's get right to it. So why don't we first do this? Let's have the audience learn a little bit about you guys. Um, I, I, yeah. So Max, why don't you go first? Sure. My name is Maxwell Sanchez. I've been in the space since 2011, been developing software for it since 2012. Uh, started out fairly simply writing. I wrote the first GUI for PeerCoin. Uh, I did a lot of early kind of ancillary software, um, mining management tools, things like that. I uh, played around a lot in the mining space, um, never too seriously, but I started a small company that built mining hardware. And then another one uh, in 2014 that did burst coin mining with uh, rented servers and um, plotted hard drives. And uh, I'm also behind the CureCoin project, which is a cryptocurrency that incentivizes protein folding for Stanford University. And through all that, I ended up meeting up with Justin about two years ago. And since then, I've been working on Veriblock and the various products that we've been creating, which are primarily the Veriblock blockchain. And then also another spinoff project we've been working on uh, for a long time, Blockchain of Custody, which is using Bitcoin's uh, proof and validation abilities to uh, basically ensure the integrity of digital evidence for things like uh, police officers, uh, 911 services, things like that. Okay. And Justin, would you please introduce yourself? Um, sure. Uh, thank you, Christian. My name is Justin Fisher. I'm the co-founder CEO here at Veriblock. Um, my background is primarily in internet bandwidth, uh, web hosting, financial information services, and telecommunications. Um, Co-founded some ISPs, uh, helped on the launch of an internet bank that was recently sold. And um, I came in contact with the crypto space. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Linux advocate uh, since you know, 94, 95. Me too. Okay. So Slackware was the where I, where I made my bones. Yep. There. Yep. I remember that. Um, I attempted Linux by scratch. I wouldn't consider it a success, but it was a great learning experiment. <laughs> um, and... Um, so, you know, being a, an advocate of Linux and, and, you know, fascinated with, with all of its abilities it's, and what it offers, um, anytime I'm in a big, at a bookstore, I always try to support the community by buying pretty much any Linux magazine that they have. And I'll just stack them up and uh, enjoy a lot of uh, reading for the week. So in my foray of doing that exercise, I uh, came across uh, Bitcoin. And I, I think it was Linux Journal. It was one of the rags. I don't know which one. And um, I, I was fascinated. And one of the statistics that uh, stood out with me was the fact that I think the market cap was like 26 million at the yeah. time. So I don't know what the date would be, but if you look at the market cap, it would be around when it was 26 million. And it was, you know, trading pennies to a dollar, something like that. It was starting to get a little buzz. And that uh, kind of piqued my interest because I remember, you know, eCash coming and going back in the 90s and attempts at, you know, digital gold and all these other things. And um, and I hadn't really connected the dots like many people in the space. So that was kind of my foray and my intro into the space. And um, I had reached out to one of our co-founders of Veriblock, uh, Jeff Roshman. And I said, hey, you know, we should look at this space. And um, uh, we were working on other projects at the time. He said, you know, it wasn't really that interesting. And then in 13, we heard about all the investments breaking out and a lot of the smart money, uh, smart money started to come in. So we revisited the space and... Um, uh, one thing led to another, yada, yada, yada. Max and I connected at a conference in um, uh, Miami, a North American Bitcoin conference. And uh, one of the interest, one of the reasons that I connected with Max was because, um, and I'll wrap it up here, is that uh, he was working on uh, CureCoin, which was very similar to an idea that I had for, like everybody who comes into the space, a more efficient way to do proof of work, which we'll get into that later. But 
naively at the time, I thought, because my son was doing a lot of stuff with Blender, another yeah. great source project. Yep. And I saw similarities between um, you know, Blender and doing rendering to that as a form of proof of work. And I, I approached Max about the idea of doing what's called RenderCoin, which we never launched. Um, but the idea was uh, very interesting to us. And he shot me back a white paper and just destroyed the idea. Of why <laughs> and I thought, this guy's really smart. And we, we hit it off after that. And, and, um, and again, we really started hitting the, um, getting traction with um, a project for using a Bitcoin to secure digital evidence. Uh, uh -huh. So that's that's a little bit about my background. Thank you, Christian. As uh, so, just for the audience, as I told you, these guys are very bright guys. Um, Justin, you seem like you might be a kindred spirit. When I first learned about Linux, I had the intuition that it was going to be huge. It was going to help humanity. It was just open source. I was completely enthralled, like you, and I couldn't get enough of it. And I learned everything I could. I even remember a boss saying, "Chris, you got to knock this off. You got to do some Windows stuff." And I refuse to touch windows and then <laughs> bitcoin kind of reminds the blockchains in general kind of reminds me of that i kind of have that same intuition that this is i, I can't no I'm, no amount of time that i spend is too much because it's just like linux this is going to be huge obviously and it's got, were you kind of the same way yeah i mean i'm obviously um i'm not as technically you know i i, I go down my i i know some administration you know i'm not I'm not like a hardcore expert by any stretch of the imagination, but my affection and appreciation from a macro perspective, I think definitely aligns with a lot of the core philosophies you described. And, and I, by the way, I looked at your LinkedIn profile and I see that you're an advocate of uh, homeschooling, which I found. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So I, my, my son was also uh, homeschooled through. Florida. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's worked out well for us. Yeah. So um, let's, let's talk about, the your technology oh actually before we do that so how did you find out about ethereum classic and what do you think about uh, ethereum classic max so for ethereum classic um i was following of course the ethereum project has you know, gained a lot of traction got a lot of trading volume huge market cap uh, and then of course the dow happened and i was watching how all that was going to go down and uh, i was actually talking with justin we were we get into kind of long philosophical discussions of, you know, what's, you know, separating purity from reality and whatnot. And um, there was all the issues upcoming with the Ethereum fork. And we were thinking, you know, Ethereum's original branding was, hey, you know, let's, you know, the code is law, right? Yeah. And, um, and then and it's okay to, you know, change that law when, you know, there's reasons to do so, bug fixes, adding new features, things like that. But, when there is, you know, kind of a bailout type of a situation, it seems like, you know, the people subscribe to a contract and, you know, if code is law, then let code be law. And so we, and then we saw the Ethereum Classic project and we saw that taking off and getting some traction and it looked really interesting. And so we followed it. Uh, of course, we got some, at least I got some, I think Justin probably did too, some Ethereum Classic tokens uh, from the split because you get Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Yep. Uh, and then I bought some more Classic um, a few months later on the advice of, um, pretty much the community whose uh, bill was involved in saying it, it was looking really interesting. And so we met up with uh, Carlo in New York, spent a day talking about the two projects, our project and Ethereum Classic, and really just got into it from a purity perspective, which we'll kind of go into a little bit later with um, Bitcoin and proof of work and how we see all that uh, turning out. But the fact that, you know, let code be law and make changes when you need to change the protocol, not when someone made a mistake given the current protocol and you need to uh, bail them out. So we really aligned philosophically with those sorts of ideals. Uh -huh. And the project looked interesting. It got a lot of traction, so we kept following it. Okay, great. Uh, Justin, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, he, you know, I thought the, um, the Ethereum project, you know, I bought into the concept of smart contracts, um, I, I think it was a wonderful idea. I probably, when I, I, I actually originally, I had a minor, uh, just kind of an interest stake in the ICO. Um, it was real exciting. I didn't really understand the tech like I do today. Uh -huh. uh, it was more just, I was, I was enthralled by the notion of a smart contract and it really excited me. I wanted to see the project unfold, see where it could go. And, um, uh, I, you know, I'm 
I got out at around 250 and tried to get back in and whatnot and traded around and um, I got caught in the Dow thing and uh, and again we're talking a few hundred bucks and nothing crazy but I, the experience was enough for me to say you know I just just kind of felt like you know, the rollback was helped some people but you know if you were holding it and you watched your price decline it hurt you so yeah. it was kind of like well you know we're we're hurting one to help another and, and you know and, and at the end of the day you've got to let things be where they're going to be and go where they're going to go so um for me ethereum classic when i read i think it was a post by uh, barry silbert my uh -huh. son yeah yep. he, um i think he's a he's a good mind in the space and when i watched him get when he kind of like when I heard other people voicing similar philosophies that I uh, adhered to, um, and, and I'm not perfect. I don't know if I'm right. I just it seemed to me like, you know, code is law. I mean, that's what we said. You know, let's uh -huh. let's let's live and die by our decisions. And, um, and when he came around and kind of supported it, and I saw, I, I thought, oh wow, they're still mining the coin. This is really exciting. So, I, I mean, how can you not like that? I mean, yeah. I, on principle, I, I how can you not like that? And yeah. I just had so much more respect for the project, even more so after that. It just excited me. That notion excited me, I guess. I'm a sucker like that. <laughs> I'm sure that that'll be encouraging to ETC uh, fans that, you know, business people are attracted by the, the, the philosophy, the social contract. That was, that was always the hope that the principles would be, be valuable, uh, you know, all in, in business also, that there'd be a, a value to that financially, um, among other benefits. Um, all right, so I was reading about your proof of proof, uh, that paper, I was reading about that idea, and that seemed like a, a really cool idea, it was something I, uh, I kind of wish I would have thought of, actually. Um, but uh, if I, well, well, you can talk about it, but basically you're, if I understand correctly, you're leveraging the, the, tr the not, I don't know if trust is we want to use that word, but uh, you're leveraging the credibility and everyone's faith in the Bitcoin system, right? F to, uh, uh, to, for f the uh, little, little uh, projects, little new altcoins could use Bitcoin. Is that correct? Basically. Yeah. So the, the idea is, is Bitcoin is incredibly secure. Um, you have ridiculous hash rate behind it. You have an incredible community built around it. It's very, very decentralized and distributed. And so the idea was to adopt that because Bitcoin at the end of the day isn't about, you know, you can move money on Bitcoin. That's one use of it. But the real value of Bitcoin is the ability to prove that something happened, whether it be moving money or that data existed at a certain time. Mm -hmm. And so being able to leverage that immutability of Bitcoin uh, and then give that to other blockchains that want to adopt it for to en enhance their security, um, mm -hmm. either new blockchains coming out or blockchains like Ethereum Classic, perhaps that have. Uh, potential concerns about, you know, because you forked off from Ethereum, there's some contention, same hashing algorithm. Uh, you know, you're, you're sort of a target. So we thought blockchains like that would be really, really good to get on board with the technology. Um, but it's all about any blockchain that needs to or wants to enhance the current consensus security they have. We're talking about making sure that forks at, you know, the, the consensus level, not code forks or anything, but forking of, you know, a miner attacks the network and does a 51% attack or something similar. Uh, we wanted to provide Bitcoin security down to those chains that wanted that additional layer of security. We're also for proof of stake coins, that additional um, being able to get around issues concerning weak subjectivity and, and node bootstrapping. Uh -huh. and um, yeah, so it plays into pretty much sense. any blockchain and, and it straps on top. It doesn't replace what other blockchains are doing in their consensus. It straps on top and then adds long term consensus uh -huh. and security and assurance to what they're already doing. So is it correct to say that, because that's the first thought that came to my mind when Justin mentioned this uh, Blender uh, blockchain, and then you talked about your protein folding blockchain. If everybody has these interesting projects, um, they don't have the mining power, right? But so your proof of proof system could bring the full brunt, all the firepower that Bitcoin has for everybody's favorite little blockchain system. Is that correct? Um, exactly. If, if I can just, if you know, I think Max, what do you think um, about the idea of maybe presenting uh, a, a, a quick, a quick soundbite on kind of the evolution of the idea? Because it might, the idea that, so Max and I, we evolved into um, 
the idea. I was looking at another play for a VC friend of mine. He was thinking about investing in body cameras after the issue in um, uh, outside of St. Louis. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, at the same time, I was also looking at RenderCoin and the project idea had fallen apart. Um, and I thought, my gosh, you know, we were, we were talking about securing data. I mean, what if you, you know, what if you took those cams and you were securing it, you were, you know, taking those hashes and securing it to Bitcoin in real time, it would be irrefutable evidence. And we, we came up with the name, uh, you know, blockchain of custody instead of chain of custody. So we thought, wow, that's really clever. That's cute. You know, that actually, um, in, you know, we actually take a traditional idea. We show how this new idea can be a, actually a better solution. I mean, fundamentally, when you look at chain of custody in a legacy environment, the longer the evidence remains in custody, the less secure it becomes. Yes. We're in a blockchain of custody. The longer it remains in custody, the more secure it becomes. Uh -huh. When you look at that underlying principle, that to me, you know, it, it, it's, it, it shows clearly that there's something special going on. Uh -huh. so through the evolution of that project, you know, I got to thinking with Max, like we, we, we were talking and, and we were like, I, 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 that's when I learned. And again, I'm, you know, figuring this out. I didn't even understand the idea that a blockchain couldn't secure itself because it can't hold a private key. And that's where the idea of proof of proof evolved was okay. that, um, you know, could we, ad could we adhere to the principles of the attributes that, you know, proof of work has, you know, trustless, decentralized, permissionless, and transparent. Could we take those attributes and carry it over to a mechanism where, you know, humans are uh, mechanically turked, if you will, to act on behalf of a blockchain following those attributes and that's that's kind of where that uh, that idea evolved from versus you know certainly you can have a federation or a central authority act on behalf but you know here we've got that human element again so proof of proof was about overcoming that obstacle of uh even centralized time stamping we wanted to do it in a decentralized manner that was our goal i don't yeah. know if and then further to the point about um, blockchains not being able to hold a private key and secure themselves, kind of like the Bitcoin paradigm of, you know, Bitcoin can't mine itself. Bitcoin can, though, incentivize people to mine for it. Um, same kind of parallel with proof of proof. A blockchain can't act on its own behalf and publish data to another blockchain in a, you know, reliable manner. But it can pay people and then validate that the work was done correctly. And so we're, we're bringing that same paradigm over to instead of mining... Traditionally, proof of work, we're doing mining as uh, publication of okay. putting data somewhere and then proving that you did so. Yes. Now, um, uh, you guys are very polite. I know you guys don't want to start any turf wars with any other uh, technologies, but if you, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear your thoughts about some, some other ideas because other people have maybe don't ha have exactly your idea, but I, I, other ideas that try to build on the... Bitcoin system come to mind, like colored coins, root stock, side chains. Um, do you want to maybe comment of what else is out there and how you guys fit into that nest? That pop? Sure. So on the level of consensus protocols um, and being able to inherit security from other blockchains or right on top of them, uh, there's stuff like merge mining. Uh, and merge mining encounters um, some potential attack vectors with uh, essentially, th there's an adoption curve, which is a little bit difficult. Where, as you know, merge my blockchain, just call it you know Namecoin or whatever. Uh, one, they have to get Bitcoin miners to actively uh, watch their network and monitor it, and maintain pretty much a full node on that network, and also to do traditional Bitcoin mining. So they have to one adopt, hear about your project, two decide to adopt it, and then work it into their system. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's that difficulty of adoption there. Where, you know, you, you put a transaction on Bitcoin, you don't have to talk to the miners. You don't have to go to the miners and tell them, hey, I'm going to do a transaction. Is everyone cool with this? You just submit your transaction. It goes into the network. We yeah. wanted inheriting security to be uh, similar where, you know, you don't have to go to the Bitcoin miners. They don't even have to know you exist. Uh, they don't care. Because we, we saw, you know, with merge mining or something, them having to run, you know, a name coin node or something is almost like a block size increase effectively because mm -hmm. they're validating more data. Um, they're doing more work, they have more bandwidth requirements to be able to mine effectively, whereas, you know, we want to inherit the security without their permission, mm -hmm. without their um, interplay. And then there's also an issue of 
even when you get, you know, some of them, you don't get all of Bitcoin's hash rate. If you get 30% of the miners, you get 30% of Bitcoin's hash rate. And the other, uh, whatever percent, 70% there could, you know, turn around and potentially attack your chain while still mining Bitcoin. So there's not as much of a, a um, deterrent from them performing a forking attack because they can continue in most uh, implementations of merge mining, they can continue to mine Bitcoin or whatever coin normally while they attack your network instead of switching from mining Bitcoin to not mining Bitcoin. There's not that opportunity cost. Uh -huh. So that was, that was with merge mining. Merge mining is a great idea. And there's a lot of interplay between merge mining and our technology where you could use merge mining to create initial consensus and then proof of proof to create long-term consensus. And that, um, would, that would de-incentify an attack. And then, you know, just to kind of summarize what Max said, kind of like in a layman's term, you know, if you look at Namecoin, for example, as a merge mining uh, platform, great. I've loved the project. I I really love to see where it goes. I, I like the idea of decentralized DNS. But um, with, so for example, you know, Namecoin, if let's say at some point, one of the domain names becomes worth $100 million or $50 million, well, the miners on Bitcoin would be highly incentivized to turn around and attack the minority. <laughs> yeah, good point. So that's kind of where that, I just wanted to put that example out there. Um, macro. That, that's my job. I do the kind of the macro. I try to like simplify it and, and max make sure I stay on the rails. I think that's no, 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 yeah, no, like good. And if I could just help you, I can add my own simplification. So merged mining basically uh, in a nutshell does all this cool stuff as long as they could get permission from the miners. Whereas uh, you guys are another option that, where you don't need to ask, you don't need any special permissions, any special hard forks of Bitcoin, uh, and you get the full power of the miners. Right, and regular mining doesn't require anything um, to be changed, and regular merge mining with Bitcoin doesn't require any Bitcoin protocol changes. Um, That's right. But it does require, yeah, yeah, adoption of the miners and getting them to understand and support your project, and then the opportunity cost. So. The main things we tried to solve with merge mining uh, or the two working together would be uh, not needing to get Bitcoin miners involved and then also not having a very low opportunity cost of uh, attacking the network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the two work together very, very well. You can merge mine a coin and then do proof of proof. And um, it's not a replacement, it's not one or the other. They're yeah. similar technologies that can be used together. Okay. And then, um, do you want to say something about colored coins and rootstock? Those are two other projects that come to mind that try to build on top of Bitcoin. How do you? Or, how sure. Do you so, so in the um, perspective of um, colored coins, what we call uh, like layered technologies or embedded protocols, uh -huh. things that ride on the Bitcoin blockchain, mm -hmm. they're very, very secure. They're as secure as Bitcoin, essentially, uh, unless they have an underlying, you know, protocol issue that's unrelated to consensus. But consensus-wise, they are as secure as Bitcoin. The issue really comes down to scalability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bitcoin, we have a one megabyte block size right now. It's, it's, and I'm not saying we should increase it. In fact, my personal belief is we should either keep it the same or decrease it to make Bitcoin an efficient provider of, of proof rather than a, a high-volume transaction network. Mm -hmm. Neither here nor there, but embedded protocols in Bitcoin or in any other token... Um, really do face scalability issues because their entire blockchain, or at least the important parts of their blockchain in the case of projects like OmniLayer um, or Color Coins, they need to be embedded in Bitcoin, and that's very, very limited and very, very expensive space. And so every time you do a counterparty transaction, every time you do an OmniLayer transaction, um, you end up incurring a Bitcoin transaction fee. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a very expensive way to inherit that security. It works, it's very, very secure. Um, and depending on the underlying blockchain, it can scale to various degrees. And there are ways to create things like payment channels on top of layered technologies. But uh, at a foundation, you are sort of at the, the whim of the network you ride upon. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't get to make uh, major decisions about your blockchain structure because you are, you are very, very limited in, uh, of course, the space you can use. And then also the um a lot of these interface with the bitcoin protocol to various degrees counterparty for example uses regular bitcoin addresses so if you wanted to do you know some kind of post quantum computing signature or something it'd be very very difficult between both the space they require and also bridging away from that bitcoin protocol to do that in an embedded uh, type platform 
So if I if I understand you correctly, you were talking about the, the expense of colored coins. Would it be correct to say that it's it has a lot of security, but it, it some might say that it uh, it it hugs the the Bitcoin system too tightly, and so it's less flexible. Whereas if somebody wants more flexibility, your your system would would provide that, but at the same time still. Uh, uh, connect to the to the Bitcoin and provide uh, security as well. Is that an accurate statement? For sure, yeah. If you want more control over your blockchain, the the things like block size or or whatever, um, you want to have more control over your own protocol, how everything's structured. That's really that's the reason people create their own blockchains. And doing that as opposed to an embedded protocol, using us, they can still get that security from Bitcoin without having to adhere to the constraints of Bitcoin or being tied to Bitcoin and uh, certain other technological fashions like using Bitcoin addresses or whatever mm -hmm. that are basically requirements to be, you know, at all efficient. So embedded protocols are expensive and they're at the whim of, of Bitcoin transaction fees. If, you know, you're in, uh, you have counterparty tokens and the Bitcoin transaction fee is higher than the value of your tokens, you effectively lost your tokens. Yeah, whereas, whereas on, with your system, you could do, you know, a, a thousand transactions on your alternate blockchain and then have only a f incur the cost of maybe one or a few Bitcoin transactions, right? Exactly. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, and then that, that cost would be subsidized by uh, sort of like a Coinbase reward similar to Bitcoin mining where, you know, people are getting paid to perform this. Uh, it's, it's not like the developers of the coin are doing this or have to do this or anything. It's, it's a decentralized distributed incentive compatible system where people are coming in doing that security work uh, for proof of proof mining on behalf of the subordinate blockchain or the, the um, partner so, blockchain, auxiliary blockchain, and then they're bringing that up to Bitcoin, proving that they did it uh -huh. uh, in such a way that the, old, the other blockchain can operate however it wants to operate. All that matters is that it can validate those periodically, Bitcoin proofs. Yeah, periodically, yeah, right to the Bitcoin chain. Justin, do you want to say something? Um, no, I, mean, I think Mac, you know, Max encompassed it. You know, um, the when we talk about block size being smaller instead of larger, um, the, the idea being behind, and, and, you know, without going into the religion of it, um, you know, if, if you look at, for me personally in my journey, um, I keep circling back to Bitcoin as proof and that it's the, um, in a, fundamentally from the perspective of, a legacy chain of custody versus a blockchain of custody. Mm -hmm. When you just simply look at that dichotomy, it completely expresses um, an intangible uh, aspect that I'm, most fa I'm personally most fascinated and excited by. Mm -hmm. And whatever you want to call that, however you want to refer to it, whatever it becomes, whatever it evolves to, um, that notion, that intangible value, the, the proof, mm -hmm. um, to me is you know, fundamentally fascinating. So then that begets the question, well, if you have a larger block size, does it make it harder for the data to propagate? And why is it harder to propagate? What's in the payload? What are we moving around here? Is it mm -hmm. the most efficient way to garner proof? Yeah. And if you can inherit that proof effortlessly and in a very compressed Merkle root be it manner, whatever the, you know, the, the method of proofing is, then why have all that extra overhead? Well, if you make the argument that it's it's relevant to buy Bitcoin or high volume transactions, I'm sorry, bubble gum with Bitcoin or a cup of coffee, you know, that's obviously the debate that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I'm smart enough to decide what's best. I can simply say I've I've got a bias based on a passion for proof. And if the if the cleanest and most efficient way to garner proof is by making the payload as small as feasibly possible so it can propagate the quickest. Um, and allow the mining to mine, then, you know, then I would go, let's go smaller. Let's not go bigger. Let's, let's bring more players into the space. Let's make the propagation faster. Um, that would lend itself to decentralization, et cetera. So that's all I would want to add in regards to the block size, because, you know, when we opened the conversation, we talked about not picking turf wars. So <laughs> it's probably a disclaimer we need to put out there. It's a passion about, you know, is, can you perform efficient uh, proof? while also handling high volume transactions. So we're, we're willing to let the market decide that and uh -huh. we're willing to live with the, with whatever the result is and, and, and adapt to and adopt and adapt to that. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. So if I, just for the benefit of our audience, 
um, if correct me if I'm wrong, but you're you're describing the two visions of of Bitcoin. The uh, do you want it to be a better credit card, or do you want it to be a better uh, armored truck, or you know Fort Knox where security, you know, it's dependable, it doesn't change very much, or do you want that, that you know, convenience, speed? And so the, that's, of course, the competing, the debate that's happening right now. And so I could see why you guys would uh, value uh, the, 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 the security, the, the reliability more than the, that's, that's, that goes with your... Well, I mean, if you're going to be doing high volume transactions and your, your, your risk is the cup of a coffee, uh, rather a cup of coffee uh -huh. is the overhead that we want to put on the world's greatest proofing utility that's ever existed. And it's probably one of the most profound inventions in regards to, I mean, I didn't really understand this and when it hit me, it was pretty profound. You know, just the idea of synchronizing uh, you know, separate nodes that are actually hostile toward each other, but being able to agree upon that information without having to trust either side. I mean, that just has such profound implications to me. Mm -hmm. And if, and if, and if, you know, the way I kind of liken it is, is that you've got this, um, you've got this, you know, we've got a limited resource. We don't know how fast memory can scale or bandwidth can scale. We know it scales. We know, but we don't know that it's going to keep up with the rate if hyper transactions get adopted on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, you know, it's a market decision. I'm not, I'm certainly not smart enough to be the one to, to, to say you should do this or you should do that. I think the economics of, of the market will inevitably decide what's going to be best. But my bet for me personally is that, you know, ultimately I think the world, I would say it's more and more in this line, Christian, I think the world could stand to benefit tremendously from a proof utility that is second to none. Mm -hmm. And if other chains can successfully provide value for buying cups of coffee and do so in an effective manner without without stepping on the proof utility, but instead benefiting from the proof utility, well, that's a better symbiotic relationship than trying to stuff everything into one pile, in my opinion. But that's, again, that's yet to be determined because one would argue that, well, you know, because in, in our situation, what we're proposing, the value still works its way up to Bitcoin to incentivize the miners, right? So everyone talks about a scaling problem with Bitcoin, but Bitcoin, in my opinion, it has zero scaling problem. It's actually unlimitedly scalable the way it sits now because I see the scale happening at the transaction fee level, not at the block size level. Mm -hmm. I see proof as a rare commodity. There's only one set of hashing power in the world that's, that's Bitcoin. And what is the value of that? Well, I mean... You would, I mean, think about what we spend a year on title insurance. Think about what we spend a year in chains of custody. So when you look at the profound implications of how this is going to impact our world, I mean, globally as a society, I mean, with this technology, we've literally leveled up as long as we remain a, a species of law. Mm -hmm. As long as we're governed by law, having proof is a cornerstone of that. And I see proof as a pillar. So for me, I, see, I, I think things generally find a way to distill themselves down to their essence. And I think proof as a utility will do such a thing. Um, and if, if it was transactions that brought us to the game and, and commerce or, or cryptocurrency that brought us to the game, so be it. I, I mean, I would want to say thank you and say, maybe it, maybe, it, maybe, it, maybe it should be on something like Lightning with SegWit. Maybe it should be off chain completely. Yeah. And, and the risk should be mitigated by securing the height of your blockchain. Because there's only so much room for proof at our current rate, because if you keep making the block sizes larger, you know, propagation is going to be, it's going to play a role. I mean, let, there's nobody that could argue that propagation is faster with smaller payloads, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's irrefutable in that yeah. sense. Yeah, you know, you just, uh, something just clicked with me if I could do your marketing for you. Uh, just kidding. But uh, um, so, yeah, you, what you, uh, so, you can have it both ways the 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 conservative people that don't want to change bitcoin because it works and and let's not mess with it the people that want the 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 better credit card the better whatever they could use your system or something like it off chain and then so you you have the best of both worlds right you don't have to mess with the the, the first blockchain system that works so wonderfully so that makes a lot of sense yeah, i mean it's 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 the largest secure uh, um 
uh, proof utility in the world, second to none. And if you're going to peel off half the mining and say, well, or all of it or whatever, I don't know what's going to happen. I, 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 you know, we're going to follow the longest chain, obviously. Or I'll let Max talk to that. I won't, I won't step over my own intellect and <laughs> try, okay. try to wander where I don't belong. But yeah, I think I expressed it. I mean, you know, proof is it's a pillar of a society that's governed by law. And when you look at the benefits of proof, it's not something that should be taken lightly. And I almost feel like it was originally kind of one of the cornerstone elements. It's very ethereal. Uh, mm -hmm. No pun intended. It's hard to really wrap yourself around, um, but when you when you start to connect with it, you realize how important and how um, uh, it, it's. Just, I don't know. I think it's critical. I think it's it's obvious when you when you go down these rabbit holes, you come up with stuff and you start to adhere to principles. And and um, who knows who's right? I'm, I I don't like to make it about right wrong. It's a passion. I'm passionate about it. I want to protect that utility. And ultimately, I think the world is going to have the most efficient proofing utility available. And I hope it's Bitcoin. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, Max, I have a tech question for you, if I may. So uh, Justin talked about the trustless nature of Bitcoin. This altcoins that use your system of proof of proof, is it also trustless or does it require a federation to manage the writing to the Bitcoin blockchain? Can you speak to that? E yeah, good question. There's, there's absolutely no federation. Anyone, just like Bitcoin mining, anyone can, you know, buy hardware, set it up and start mining. No one needs to, they don't need a license from Bitcoin. They don't need anyone to agree that they should do it. They don't need anyone to be voting for them or anything. Okay. Uh, so too is the case with proof of proof. You know, any, any proof of proof miner can come along and perform proof of proof publications and secure an auxiliary blockchain uh, without any, anybody's permission. They can join and leave at will. Uh -huh. um, it's no one, you can be totally anonymous with it. You, you don't have to have a public identity with anything other than an address to get paid for. So okay. it's very, very similar to Bitcoin mining in that regard. Anyone can join, anyone can leave, and then everyone can see the work that other people are doing on the blockchain. I'm sure a lot of people are, are going to love to hear that your system is also trustless. Um, now, if I understand correctly, um, so the, the value proposition of rootstock, you get all this cool stuff, but the, you have to accept a federation. Um, now, could they possibly use your proof of proof to avoid the federation and not, uh, can, can you say something about that? Do you know anything about rootstock? Yeah, um, proof of proof is a consensus protocol. So uh, there's certainly interplay and we do plan to work with rootstock in the future. Uh -huh. um, and they could easily adopt our technology. It wouldn't remove the need for um, the federation for the two-way peg between the currencies. Uh -huh. uh, proof of proof is, is a means of establishing and maintaining consensus um, over your blockchain. It doesn't help with uh, inter-blockchain communication of, you know, like movement of funds or something that would be a different case. But uh -huh. Rootstock could certainly adopt the technology. Rootstock as it exists uh, today and is uh, utilizing merge mining with Bitcoin. And so they can strap proof of proof on top of it, get more security through it, uh, avoid some of the concerns with, um, you know, opportunity cost of attacking their network. Uh, and then the, the federation of tokens, the movement, the two-way peg for the side chain would have to be solved either with continuing to use uh, a federated or semi-federated solution or getting uh, additional opcodes and functionality added to Bitcoin to enable uh, some more side chain functionality on Bitcoin side. So hard fork basically would be basically yeah it, it would it, yeah um okay. there, there's a lot of ideas in the space for how to do side chains uh there's a lot of really exciting work um there's a project called drive chain which is really interesting um they do all at some level uh require that either there's uh, some form of federation or they give um the onus of validation to Bitcoin miners and have Bitcoin miners similar in the way of merge mining. They have Bitcoin miners who are tracking the network and um, accepting or declining things that occur on Bitcoin based on the state of that other network. Uh -huh. uh, so without additional changes, which would likely require a hard fork to Bitcoin, um, actual truly trustless, permissionless, decentralized side chains that don't require any sort of involvement of Bitcoin miners or, or a federation or anything uh, are pretty much impossible. Okay. All right. Um, now, if I may, if it's okay with you guys, I'd like to move on to, so I think people now have an idea that what, what these altcoins could now do is use your technology to, to write state information to, to Bitcoin. But can, you, can we now talk 
in a little bit more detail of how uh, what you call proof of proof mining works now that we have the big picture? Sure. So a proof of proof miner is essentially taking what we're calling state data, um, which on a proof of work blockchain, say, for example, Ethereum Classic, it would be a block header. Uh, enough data to validate that there is at least either a valid block or someone did a lot of work to pretend they had a valid block. Uh, you're taking that data, that state data, and they're putting it on Bitcoin. Uh, and actually, we're building uh, what, what we're calling the Veriblock blockchain, which is a aggregation layer between other blockchains and Bitcoin. It makes it easier to adopt. Publishing data to Bitcoin is a little bit difficult in that you're limited, generally speaking, to 80 bytes in an op return. You can, of course, chain multiple op returns together and get really fancy, but um, there's it's also very, very expensive as Bitcoin transaction fees continue to rise. So we're building an aggregation layer where blockchains can actually do proof of proof to Veriblock and then Veriblock does proof of proof to Bitcoin. Okay. And so blockchains can do it direct, they can do it through us. Um, we're making and rolling out a set of tools that make it super, super easy to adopt and add on to existing blockchain projects. And those would use the Veriblock blockchain for that security. Uh, it also provides intermediate security to them because Veriblock does have its own proof of work as well. And so we can get into that a little bit more if people are interested. But um, fundamentally, the idea of proof of proof is to take data from a blockchain you want to secure, state data that can be validated, like a block header, or in the case of proof of stake, a block header plus some additional information uh, that essentially proves their stake, uh, something like the hash of a transaction that they're using that should exist in the UTXO before they consume stake age or something like that. All of that data, whatever's needed to validate that, there's a plausible um, block on the blockchain, kind of like SPV level access, take that, publish it to Bitcoin, and then create a, construct a proof of that publication to Bitcoin and return that to the subordinate network. And that gives that, that auxiliary network um, the, what, what effectively amounts to SPV level knowledge of Bitcoin, where they can track Bitcoin consensus. They have mm -hmm. all the Bitcoin headers needed to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. If someone provides evidence of a longer Bitcoin chain, uh, they can validate that longer chain instead and validate their data against it. So can and that gives them, oh, sorry. Uh -huh. I was going to say, so I presume diff the way your system works is different altcoins can decide uh, uh, what's, uh, how many transactions go into every write, uh, every proof on the, bit the Bitcoin chain. And uh, is that correct? And you basically make um, a hash of a hash of all of it, a nice tiny hash. And that's what gets written. Pretty much. The, the data you're writing is, uh, what, what you're doing when you're proof-of-proof -proof mining is you are securing existing blocks on the subordinate or the auxiliary network. Mm -hmm. You're taking, you know, block 1000, which just came out, and yeah, a regular proof-of-work proof, or proof of work or proof-of-stake miner created this block that has a bundle of transactions, and you're validating that block to Bitcoin. Uh, and so the idea being, if that block is ever challenged, then Bitcoin can be referenced as the ultimate arbiter of truth. Wait, and wait, so, wait. So I just thought of something. So what you're saying is the altcoin will still have a proof of work system like Bitcoin. Now, but your system makes it more secure by by leveraging the security of Bitcoin. So why would an altcoin need a proof of work system at all? Why not just junk it and rely completely on your proof of proof? That's a really good uh, question. And that's sort of the idea of ChainDB in, in a nutshell was you know let let the people who are doing this proof of proof what we're calling proof of proof that word didn't exist in chain db but what we're calling proof of proof the people doing that let's let them assemble the blocks too mm -hmm. um there ends up being some game theory issues with that uh the blockchains that we secure still need to establish immediate consensus they need a way to actually create blocks and on a short term agree to those blocks mm -hmm. and then what we provide is that long range protection you know you won't get forked back an hour a day a week a month a year Okay. Um, so they need that immediate or intermediate consensus where they can have the network agree to a block temporarily before it gets validated up to Bitcoin. The issue with having, um, and the thing is a lot of proof of proof miners who are all working separately, none of them are know each other necessarily or work together. They're all publishing the same data to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So they're all taking that same last block 1000 on the auxiliary chain and they're putting that data on Bitcoin. It's the same data and they're, they're duplicating each other's efforts. Similar to mining, everyone's mining 
a similar set of transactions. Here you're securing the same block. Uh, and then miners, of course, are mining on top of, generally speaking, they're all mining on top of the same block. So they're validating that block by doing so. And oh, so, so you would still have, you uh, interesting, so you'd have competing miners all writing to the, to the, the, the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, so you'd have redundancy then. That's right. Right, there's, there's redundancy, and then it also makes it, if someone's building an attacking chain, they would have to also do those publications in broad daylight, so everyone would see they're building a chain before they release their fork. Mm -hmm. um, but what's really cool is that with that sort of a system, you have a, a uh, separation of power where the ability to decide what transactions get into the network mm -hmm. is separate from the ability to secure that decision. Um, okay. So miners, traditional miners, proof of work could be proof of stake miners, um, whatever have you, traditional consensus mechanisms. Uh, the, the block creators, block formers in that protocol, whether it be miners with ASICs or, or proof of stake, they are bundling those transactions and there's no way for a network to, for everyone on a network to agree that this should be the next block other than someone saying this is the next block and I did work to prove so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like all the nodes on the Bitcoin network have a similar but slightly different mempool. They have different transactions in the mempool. They have different relay rules. Uh -huh. There's no way for them to all create the same block deterministically and then publish that block. They need someone else to create that block in in a means that everyone can agree on and, and trust and validate like proof of work. Mm -hmm. And then they can all do that duplication of work once the block's already created. Yes. Yeah, like what, so we write on top of existing consensus. Yeah, you're, you're, the, the blockchain, whatever, whatever, even remove the word blockchain from the equation. Whatever you do to achieve consensus is your business. We're not, we're just taking your blockchain state data post consensus, and then we're going to publish it in a gamified manner to the Bitcoin blockchain for, mm -hmm. for securing your block height from where you've reached consensus. It's a, is that a, is that a fair summary, Max? Yeah, we don't replace consensus, we fortify it. So your existing consensus continues as normal, and then we make it, you, you have to, you establish consensus yourself, and then we make sure that consensus is maintained by using publications to Bitcoin. Yeah, that's, that's great. So it's almost like insurance, just, uh, just to make people happy and, and sleep well at night. They can go do their, whatever they want, their new proof of stake algorithm or alternate proof of work, and then use your system just so they maybe people could do some issues that have that they can do some stuff in the short term but you you provide a ceiling they can't mess it up more than a certain number of exactly it's AI. exactly so you have a guarantee that you know this blockchain cannot fork back more than say an hour or whatever based on the properties of the system and the the uh kind of aggressiveness of the proof of proof that they're using and whatever but you can have that assurance where you say you know, we know as a fact that there's no way for consensus to ever be challenged on this block. And we mm -hmm. know everything in there is completely finalized, short of Bitcoin itself having a change in consensus. But right, if so Bitcoin right. doesn't change consensus, we know this block on our network will not change. Okay. Justin, go ahead. So if a blockchain is um, maybe may traditionally may be vulnerable to an attack because there's a they're using it hashing algorithm where there's an opposing network that uses the same algorithm and they would want to then attack the smaller hashing chain they they're de incentivized to do so now because they're only going to be able to hit at best they could just like disrupt the chain but they couldn't roll it backwards or, or undo any transactions or modify the chain so they're de incentivized to take that hashing power they're better off mining the network that's paying them than to screw somebody else's network it's just it's de incentivization in that case so there's value there yeah, so for, this, for the benefit of the audience, if I could try to make a, a simple analogy, tell me if you like this. Um, so uh, if I believe when there's a forest fire, uh, the, the firemen can, can burn a, a ring around it, right, basically. And so then they go and try to put out the fire inside the ring. But at, so worst case scenario, the fire will, will burn everything inside the ring, but it can't leave that that burn ring so so there's a there's a limit to the damage that can be done so what you're what you're doing is kind of like the burn ring would you agree with that yeah that's Did a good it, analogy we we can you know mark a certain block and, and people can look at it and say you know there's no way for consensus to be challenged here the blocks after will get that same protection in the future but we have this kind of moving that that same kind of burn ring idea of you know we know exactly if anything were to be reversed or attacked we know exactly what it would be 
uh-huh. at any point in time. We know that this can be attacked, this can't be attacked. You know, this block could be challenged, this block cannot be challenged. Okay. You know, this part of the forest can burn, we'll, we'll try to stop it, but this part certainly can't. Um, and there's an interesting paradox that, are, that, 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 that evolves from the, the idea if it's adopted. Uh-huh. More people that use it, the stronger Bitcoin gets and the better security that they receive. And then they're allowed to focus on their product or service and less on, you know, they can, they can, they can look at more efficient uh, consensus algorithms that, that are worthy of what it is that they're trying to secure. Because different blockchains are going to have different thresholds of pain for what their level of security needs to be. Mm-hmm. So if, if, if there can be a, a, a finite proving utility that people can subscribe to, a grid of proof, if you will, um, the more people that subscribe, the more, you know, the better that becomes and so on, because it becomes more worth mining. So mm-hmm. that value flows up to that proof chain. And I'm saying proof chain because, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, what if Bitcoin does, I don't know, who knows, but if, you know, right now that's where the hashing power lives and you would want to tap that because it's, it's a benefit of proof to your, your project or not you specifically, I mean, you plurally, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, as, as if it's adopted, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in that sense. And then it allows blockchains to focus on their product or service instead of getting into debates about security or centralization or trustless and blah, blah, blah. It's yeah. kind of, it kind of gets, it just wears you down and you know, let's just focus on solutions and then let the solutions start to battle it out instead of talking about you know, security as, a, as, a, um, as kind of an ad hominem argument in the sense to the blockchain. Yeah, yep. Um, now... Um, um, if I could just, can, can we, can you address, so I think people have a, 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 a little bit more of an idea of the fine details. Do you want to say something about uh, the attack ve- vectors that you've considered? I know in your paper you mentioned you had thought of some, so it, you've obviously done your homework, so why don't you talk about that? Sure. So there's uh, kind of two discussions here. First of all, uh, the paper you mentioned, if anyone wants to read through it, it's a white paper, about 20 pages, and you can go to veriblock.com and download it and look at it. Uh, the um, attack vectors against proof of proof are primarily regarding failures and consensus on Bitcoin side. Uh, okay. If a Bitcoin fork occurs, uh, then of course the consensus of the uh, auxiliary chains is also challenged. Although a fork in Bitcoin does not mean that the auxiliary chains would fork, it would only be if someone were to actively attack them along with their attack on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Um, So Bitcoin fork doesn't mean that an auxiliary chain will fork, but it does mean that an auxiliary chain may fork past that burn circle, so to speak, uh, because that burn circle is defined by Bitcoin's consensus and security. Uh, Well, now, now, in fairness to you guys, if I could, uh, so you basically said that you're you're just being honest. You're just basically saying that your security depends on Bitcoin security, and so you're just you. You, if Bitcoin has issues with their security, you guys might have issues. But well, okay, but that's I I would I would no nobody would expect otherwise. Um, So yeah, right. So that'd be the main attack vector is yeah. Bitcoin forks, or what we call it, we call it the master blockchain, whatever uh-huh. blockchain you're securing to, if that does fork or cha- consensus is challenged on it, uh-huh. you two suffer a consensus challenge potentially, although not necessarily. It would make it possible, but it does, it, it, Bitcoin forking in itself doesn't cause your chain to fork, but it, that is the way someone could fork your chain past that burn circle. Okay. So there's that, and then there were others with um, primarily issues regarding um, certain ways that proof of proof could be implemented that would be attackable. Uh, one of those is that if all you were publishing to Bitcoin um, or to the master blockchain was, say, for example, the block hash rather than the nonce, rather than the header with you know the nonce and the timestamp and everything needed to validate that proof of work if it was just the hash, uh-huh. then people can arbitrarily uh, reduce faith in your system by pretending that a fork is occurring when it's not actually occurring because they could, pog- they could publish bogus data that mm-hmm. makes it look like they've created a valid chain when they haven't. Uh, so so the mitigation can... to that is build proof okay. of proof in a way where the data you're publishing can be validated as valid within the rules of your uh, immediate consensus on your auxiliary blockchain, proof of work, proof of stake, whatever you're using. So did, wait, I, did you, is one of the points you're making that it, it's up to the altcoin 
to decide what to write to the Bitcoin blockchain, but if they don't write enough information, then they could be in trouble. So it's, that's, is that correct? Is that what you're saying? Right. So it, uh, yeah, most of the issues with the proof of proof protocol would be in, in if you implemented certain things wrong, these mm -hmm. are attack vectors that could come. And then we have, you know, ways, you know, a, a recommendation for how to make yeah, those practice. risks, best practices. Uh -huh. What we're building with, um, what we're going to be rolling out is the Veriblock network that allows that aggregation layer and then libraries that make it really easy to interface with it and mm -hmm. inherit that security. And so those libraries will, of course, use the best practices. And if you implement them correctly, according to specifications, this would, would not be an issue. Okay, um, so you'll help people to, to use your technology correctly, of course. So, yeah. Okay. Right, so most of the attack vectors just come down to either Bitcoin being attacked itself or um, implementation, if the implementation is incorrect in certain ways that may not be obvious when designing it, that there can be... Um, issues that evolve out of that. Sure, sure. The final consensus issue would be that with proof of proof, there is, if you are, are a very, very quiet blockchain and nobody's doing proof of proof, mm -hmm. obviously you're not getting the security, but your chain is actually technically at more risk because someone could create an alternative chain and do proof of proof to overcome mm -hmm. your chain uh -huh. with less raw work. So if, if your blockchain doesn't have at least some very, very minor consistent proofing uh -huh. um, you do open yourself up to more attack than if you didn't have proof of proof but if yes. you have any sort of that's right a, at all minimal proofing you know one person is doing it every hour or two then you're safe but if they absolutely abandon proof of proof but they still have it implemented in the protocol then yeah. it does create a security risk yeah so as long I was as someone's doing proof of proof you're, you're covered yeah <laughs> if you wouldn't have said that i that was that idea came to my mind when you were listing the possible attack vector so the analogy would be of course if if you make your burn ring right too big, then the fire has the potential to do a lot more damage than if you made it really close to the fire. So don't be it, it, it's 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 a mistake to to make it too big. Good enough. Yeah, and it, it's a great tool, but you just got to use it correctly. And so exactly. if you use the tool correctly, if you have you know just like Bitcoin, if Bitcoin didn't have any miners, it would be very very insecure. In fact, it wouldn't even run right. Uh -huh. uh, so too, if you don't have proof of proof miners in your network, you are vulnerable um, and if you implement proof of proof, the, the, the distinction is that that is the only case where by having proof of proof, you are made less secure is by having it, but not using it um, uh -huh. yes. would be the danger. So, okay. Now, um, Justin, did you want to add anything to that? Um, that was a pretty good summary. I mean, I, I, I don't think I'd be adding anything of value if I add anything, but uh, I, I think he said it, he said it pretty well. Well, you know, the one area that I mean, maybe it's premature that as he was talking, I was thinking about, because we talked about Veriblock, you know, if in theory proof of proof is right and it's adopted and it's embraced, then uh, seemingly if it's writing to the world's best proofing network that's available, mm -hmm. seemingly that proofing network would need to have the smallest block size feasibly possible to provide security. Uh, that's not a lot of real estate. So the fees to get into that real estate would seemingly be very high. So aggregation of proofs, proofs, proof of proofing would definitely become, you know, would be in vogue and it would be a necess necessity to provide the most efficient means for proofing. So, you know, we're going to build out Veriblock. We think it's going to have a place. We think that it's got value and we think it's the most efficient way to write to the world's greatest proofing utility, whatever that plans to be. And inevitably, if blockchains choose to use proof of proof independently and, you know, they see value in it, that's great too, because um, it's still serving the greater good as, as, as far as supporting the world's greatest proofing utility. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, if those fees become uh, cost prohibitive for a blockchain because it's proof of proof is successful, then, you know, Veriblock is readily available as a truly trustless, decentralized, permissionless, and transparent solution for doing said proof of proofs. In other mm -hmm. words, Veriblock is a gateway to the proofing network, providing a very, or the most efficient way to do the proofing, right? It's, it's an aggregation. Mm -hmm. So, and ultimately, its life or death is going to depend on those blockchains or utilities that it services. So, you know, it's it's a buy with people for the people play. Inevitably, we want to build it, launch it, set it free, and see where it goes. Mm -hmm. But 
but that's that's kind of the grand vision. So whether it's proof of proof um, or Veriblock, um, you know, we think there's value in adopting Veriblock out of the gate because if 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 in theory things play out and you run the lines down the you know down the road, inevitably roads are all going to lead back to you know trying to do a single Merkle route into the Bitcoin blockchain to secure a great deal of secure uh, uh, blockchains. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, at one point, I, uh, if I could just do your uh, help you do your marketing one more time, uh, tongue in cheek. Uh, so just let me just re emphasize that you're not necessarily stuck or wedded to Bitcoin, right? If some other system, system. also provides security, you're perfectly happy and able to switch to that other one. Is that correct? Can I, can I answer that, Max? I, I would say for me personally, philosophically, uh, I would I would say that I would consider myself a proof of work maximalist in the sense of providing proof. Uh -huh. I'm not saying that that is the end all be all for consensus. I think that there's creative, um, simply plenty of solutions that use proof of stake or whatever, whatever those consensus mechanisms, me mechanisms are. I don't think that they can truly have the same properties that proof of work has. Proof of work has its own inherent properties. And it's those properties, those intangible properties that, um, that, that I'm personally a maximalist for. And I want to move value up to the world's best utility. And if, if Bitcoin is the best form of proof of work to date, then that's what we'll use. If it's something else tomorrow, we'll use that. We're not, okay. we're, 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 we're blockchain agnostic, but we're proof centric. Okay, good. Um, let me, uh, unless you guys had any other comments, why don't we, um, why don't we wind things down by kind of moving more to the discussion towards Ethereum Classic. So you guys are Ethereum Classic fans like me. You believe in their philosophy, their vision. So would you like to maybe say something about what you could offer I Ethereum Classic now? Max? Sure. Uh, put pretty simply, what we'd like to do is um, work with the community and the Ethereum Classic developers to put together a testnet that has Ethereum Classic functionality with uh, proof of proof security. Mm -hmm. Demonstrate it, show it off, see if people like it, see if it everything works and it's, it's a good fit for the system. And uh, it, it slots in pretty well. Adopting proof of proof does require doing a hard fork of the uh, auxiliary blockchain because you are changing the way consensus is established. Uh -huh. uh, and so it's the kind of thing that since you guys have some hard forks planned in the future for things like your monetary policy, um, various changes to the platform, it's not a hard fork, but you're also doing the uh, code rewrite in Scala. Uh -huh. uh, it'd be a good time to, at any of those hard fork moments, you know, if proof of proof ends up being something that the Ethereum community, Ethereum classic community wants to adopt and see uh, live on the main chain, those forks would be a great way to put that additional functionality in without causing any more disruption to the network than the, the fork was already going to create just with, you know, switching over to new software and getting mm -hmm. everyone organized. So yes. uh, Justin, we are. it's okay. good, Justin. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, I, um, I've, I've been watching Ethereum classic. Um, I have uh, an interest in the, in the project. I think uh, you guys got a smart group of people. Mm -hmm. um, spent some time speaking with Charles and Carlo and um, smart guys. And mm -hmm. I like some of the things that you've done as far as capping the emission rate. Mm -hmm. I like some of those ideas. Um, but I, I think there's an interesting opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I, when I think about differentiating oneself and standing out and showing boldness um, and showing uh, – it's, kind of, it's thinking different, if you will. Mm -hmm. you, know, you look at Ethereum and you look at Bitcoin, um, and I'll say Ethereum Classic. I mean, Ethereum Classic feels kind of funny. I feel like I should just say Ethereum. It yeah. seems inverted, but I won't go there right now. But <laughs> um, so for the sake of being clear, Ethereum, when I look at Ethereum Classic or Ethereum Original, mm -hmm. and I look at Bitcoin, it, it, there was always this kind of this adversarial relationship. Mm -hmm. And... I see it as completely unnecessary. I, I think it's I think it's void of truly being constructive. So when I look at to me fundamentally what makes Bitcoin great, proof, mm -hmm. and then I look at you know what makes 
what what got me interested in Ethereum to begin with, you know, smart contracts and the you know the the, the virtual machine, right? This distributed mm-hmm. virtual machine, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if you can take the the chocolate of Bitcoin and put it with the peanut butter of Ethereum, uh-huh. I mean, that's a really profound idea, and it allows the debate about your mining and the hash rate and security, it puts a lot of that to rest and allows you to focus on the products and services and really building out applications and solutions. And it says a lot about the character of the community because they're saying, you know, we're not afraid of Bitcoin. We see its value and proof. You'd be stupid to deny that. So mm-hmm. it shows a lot of character. And I think that could be a unique opportunity to really, um, you know, Ethereum Classic is one of the big boys. And for mm-hmm. one of the big boys to take a step forward and embrace an idea like this, it's, um, it's a groundbreaking idea, and it could really do a lot for the community and the interest in people coming in. And I think there's a lot of smart money on the side that could come into the space because they say, you know what? That's really interesting. Bitcoin and Ethereum working together? It's mm-hmm. a profound idea, and I think it makes a grand statement to those who are on the outside who don't live in this space on a daily basis like we do to kind of say, wow, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, – you know, it's, it's, it's like, wow, they're working together and they're, 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 they're benefiting from each other's strengths. Yeah. Um, and I think and it doesn't, it doesn't really take anything away. So no. if you, right, if, if they presumably, let's say they added it to a future hard fork that was going to happen anyway, it would, it, in no way would it remove from the security. So you w- it wouldn't cost anything in a sense to add this extra. It's no cost because yeah. here's, here's the way, here's, and that's an interesting question, you know, because, okay, it sounds great. What do I, you know, what does it cost, right? Well, it, it's relative, right? Because you're going to be diverting a portion of the coin base to proof of proof miners to do the proofing on your behalf. But in exchange, you're going to inherit all that hashing power instantly for a fraction of the cost of what was spent to do the hash for you. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, the guy who's mining, okay, maybe he's not getting as much coin, but the coin he's getting could, 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 seemingly be more valuable because it's more secure and the people using the network are going to get more security and then there's one area we really haven't really touched on but it's an exciting area as well the exchanges the exchanges are going to get a set of metrics and that's one of the reasons that we think Veriblox is going to have value it, because max has got some wonderful ideas and he's working closely with right now bitrix and there's other exchanges onboarding as well in that they can provide early attack detection and a set of other metrics that allow exchanges to be able to react more quickly. And it gives more value to the entire ecosystem because with security comes value mm-hmm. because, you know, again, that ring of fire gets tighter and tighter and tighter, more compact and efficient. So yeah, the idea of Ethereum classic reaching out and seeing the value of Bitcoin's proof as a form of security to protect themselves from bigger hashing power that might want to prey on them. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that's. I think that's a pretty compelling idea, and I think it's. A, it's a great story, and it's a great narrative uh, to those who are maybe thinking about coming into the space. And I think it says a lot about the character of Ethereum Classic. Uh huh. Yeah. Wonderful. And Ethereum Classic is also like the perfect example of a blockchain where proof of proof makes sense because, you know, as you guys become more successful and get a higher market cap and edge up closer to Ethereum, you're perceived as more of a threat, and you know they, they have a an incentive to attempt to disrupt the network. And so you're at, you're at a position where there is a network that has the same hashing algorithm. They have a lot of hash power. And, you know, there is that, that conflict between, you know, Ethereum Classic encroaching on the value of Ethereum or whatever. And so it, it's a really good, it's a very large blockchain. It, it's a very unique case where, you know, there is, there is sort of a need for that protection uh, as you guys get more successful and start building more value and, and Ethereum potentially sees some sort of threat or the miners of Ethereum see some sort of threat. So Yes, very nice. You know, I think it's, it's a very nice interplay between yep. uh, the two projects. So if I was to try to summarize our discussion, uh, the hi- highlight some of the points for the listeners. So you're basically providing a, uh, a much greater security for non-Bitcoin blockchains and you provide it in a uh, essentially costless manner that to uh, in, for these alternate coins um, and you've thought about the attack vectors You're, you have a paper people can read that uh, spells it all uh, this out and so there's plenty of information plenty of thought went into this 
um, and there's a lot of value in your your idea. Is that correct? Would you want to add anything to that? Yeah, and um, we, we've gotten some peer review on the white paper. Uh, there's been very, very positive feedback on it. We're working with uh, Block Labs, so we'll have um, you know additional help and resources from them as well with uh, building out the technology and getting it adopted. And But yeah, if anyone wants to look into the technology anymore, the website's up. Uh, there's a white paper that explains it in nauseating technical detail, and if they want anything clarified, I'm always easy to contact as well. Uh -huh. And I'd be happy to answer any questions people have about the technology, how it works, um, clarifying how blockchains could adopt it, or how the rollout process looks like. Any of that can uh, is more than welcome in my inbox. So okay, uh, I want to be accessible and open. Yeah. Justin, do you want to add anything to that? Um, well, I mean, first foremost, you know, from the from the onset of meeting with Carlo in New York. Um, getting to meet Charles and now yourself, <clears throat> following the community, um, striving to understand more about it on a technical perspective, for me at least. I have a macro understanding. Max is deeply uh, into the details. He's already been writing some code. Um, you know, it's an honor. I mean, you guys are letting us on the show and, and voice our ideas. Um, you're giving us free marketing, which is, you know, <laughs> as far as your, your, what did you call it? Your marketing advice? Or you were gonna... <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that, yeah I'm not yeah. going to charge you for that. That's free. <laughs> that's, that's, there's a clear value there. Um, but, you know, that's obviously everybody operating in a vacuum office struggles with that. And sometimes to get another perspective and add an opinion, it's, it's really helpful. So uh, if, you, okay. if you want to share some other stuff after the call and uh, we'd like to keep you involved in, in our progress, what we're doing, sure. um, you know, we're just honored and grateful that you let us be a part of the show and gave us an opportunity to present to your community. And uh, our experience has been second to none. You guys have been very gracious community, and we're just proud to be a part of it. So thank you. All right. And, and, and thank you guys also for a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, I will definitely have to keep uh, it, tabs on you guys. I'm sure you guys are uh, going to do great things, and, and I'll be hearing about you in the news maybe in the future. Who knows? Um, so, yes, thank you guys again for, for coming on. And... Uh, uh, and that's it. So I wish you guys well, and we'll keep in touch. Right. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Christian. Right. Bye. If you are passionate about anything related to Ethereum Classic, and you have something to say, we'd love to discuss that with you on the show. We're always looking for interesting guests, so don't be afraid to ask.